Good morning to all our panelists and uh, good afternoon to all present uh, over the call from here, from India. So I welcome you all to this very interesting conversation that we want to have uh, here today on what purpose to be a game changer in the application of knowledge to uh, real world uh, contexts, uh, transdisciplinarity. So it's not that this hasn't been around for a while. It has been around for a while. Uh, but I think, you know, today, given today's circumstances, uh, this uh, attains a magnified uh, uh, presence in terms of, you know, how we address our, our situation. Transdisciplinarity can be considered, in my opinion, in my point of view, as an amalgamation of knowledge from a variety of disciplines in such a way as to transcend these disciplinary boundaries. It's increasingly, it is increasingly being uh, seen as a requisite to solve today's problems, ranging from sustainability to social justice, to uh, uh, standards of living, to rights, uh, and more. And when we are dealing with such complex issues, I think, you know, uh, we, we have to stretch uh, the notions of uh, how we do things and uh, uh, our current normative way of doing things. Today, we will deliberate on uh, transdisciplinarity from the perspective of design as well, specifically, you know, how ambitious a role can design play. What will design bring to the table? You know, what is the set of, uh, you know, uh, skills or proficiencies that we bring to this table that all multiple disciplines sit together? How do we as practitioners and pedagogues prepare ourselves to take on this role? Uh, because I think, you know, we're just in the beginning of what can potentially be a game-changing uh, role for design. Our panelists today bring vast experience as well as passionate engagement with what we do. We have uh, Dr. Dolly Dow, Head of Master of Design at NACAA, the first sign of French Design Institute. Uh, she brings a cross-cultural perspective and a multidisciplinary experience combining interior architecture, urbanism, uh, food management strategies. Uh, so multi-perspective, and I think it's going to be very interesting about, uh, to hear from Dr. Dalita on her uh, notions, on her perspectives. Uh, we have Professor Nikolai Boand anderson uh, Professor Nikolai is the head of Center for Sustainable Building Culture at the Royal Danish Academy. As a researcher, he engages with cultural heritage, poetics of transformation, conservation, sustainability in architecture, and the aesthetic role of a designer, which we were very fortunate to hear, I think about two months ago, uh, a talk uh, dedicated to that talk. And we also have Professor Walter Haspiesluck, if I got the pronunciation right, uh, Chief of Mobility and Urbanism Research at Grand Studio, Italy, and the course coordinator of the MA in Transdisciplinary Design at IED Torino. So very fortunate to have you here, especially, you know, given the fact that, you know, you have already ventured into this area. So without much further ado, let's get started on this discussion. I would, and I would like to direct my first question uh, to Professor Wouter, uh, given the fact that, you know, has an established view of this, uh, this area. So my question to you, Mr. Wouter, is... Uh, we know of many attempts to merge disciplinary knowledge, right? Through interdiction such as inter, multi, cross, and cross disciplinarity. So, in your opinion, how does transdisciplinarity differ from this? What is its promise? Okay, so <clears throat> to me, first and foremost, we can discuss about. Um, whether there truly is a difference between interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary. Um, but I think what is important to understand with transdisciplinary is that, um, and that is a, a bit of, of linguistics involved as well, um, it has to do with things like transcend, it has to do with things like transform, translate. And so um, the big difference to me between all these different forms of design versus transdisciplinary design is that um, in everything else except transdisciplinary design, you have people working together in one way or another, but they stay within their own discipline to approach a certain subject. 
what we try to do, or at least my understanding of transdisciplinary design is that all together with all the different backgrounds, all the people involved, all the experts approaching um, this topic, um, we are able to transcend all the disciplines and create a new discipline altogether, which might or might not exist at this very moment. And so this act of transcending to me and um, it, the sum of all the different parts becoming actually more than uh, what they used to be, to me is key to transdisciplinary design. Can we step back a little further and you know take a slightly higher level view? And you know, uh... What, what are the ideological, I think, you know, uh, provocations for this kind of thinking? Professor Wotel again. Okay. Can, you, can you repeat the, the question? Because the connection um, to me, um, or at least hi historically speaking, um, I think we came now to a point since a couple of years in which basically everything that uh, has to do with life in general, with society, um, has become very, very complex. And um, there is an entanglement of, um, uh, how to say, of, of uh, things. If you make decision A, then it has also uh, repercussions in a lot of different uh, areas that are linked to it. And so this entanglement and this complexity is something that um, increasingly um, became apparent in, um, in the last couple of years. And um, so the, the necessity to deal with this complexity, which by the way is also something that you mentioned in your, in your brief introduction, um, I think steers towards the idea that um, it is or impossible or it becomes very, very difficult for an individual or a single discipline to formulate answers to um, big questions. Hence the necessity to uh, look at the bigger picture altogether. So that, that would be my, uh, my take on, uh, on your question. I'll pass, I mean, I'll pass the question on to the Dr. Dolly and uh, uh, we would like to hear your perspectives on uh, class discipline and Yes, thank you. Uh, with Buter, what uh, what Buter said about the transdisciplinary and the history that um, led to the events in the in the world that have led to us not being able to deal with the complexity of the issues at hand um, just from one discipline, and I think it's got something to do also with systematic design and thematic <laughs> design as well. So we are dealing with systems. Um, complex systems and this does not we does not just require the skills and the knowledge of just one discipline because we will never be able to solve that um, so we need various disciplines that would melt into each other without losing their specificity and what makes them special so it's the merging of the skills and the knowledge and in many many times we actually are saying the same things, but we're saying it differently. So by um, working together, we realize that we have more in common than we have um, differences. And it's just whatever, for example, design lack, science will complement architecture, art. And when you bring people together like that, you'd be able to solve um, you know, uh, complex issues and through different ideologies. And to me, the ideology presents itself based, um, is project based. So um, that's what I, and it started probably about 50 years ago, that kind of mentality, the, the merging of the mindset of innovation, design, and um, different disciplines and design reaching out instead of just being in our own silo and thinking we can dominate the world because we can innovate. <laughs> um, Every single discipline innovates, but they innovate differently. So to me, that's what transdisciplinary design is. Professor Nikolai, can I pass on the question to you? Especially, you know, can you take a philosophical leaning uh, on, the, on the topic? Well, I can try <clears throat> if, if um, it, I agree very much what, uh, in, in what have been said already. Um, and, and of course, uh, from a, uh, from a sustainability perspective, uh, it is becoming more and more important that we do not 
work just in silos, but actually have this more uh, systems thinking, uh, thinking mm -hmm. of, of the world as a super complex system. And that, of course, involves a lot of uh, different actors. Um, I would like to uh, just, if we look at it historically first, uh, I'm an architect, uh, so uh, one of my uh, early um, colleagues, Vitruvius, he was a Roman architect who was active more than 2,000 years ago. And he wrote, and let me just read out a, a small passage that is, I find quite, quite interesting because he, he talks about the education of the architect. He says, let the architect be educated, skillful with the pencil, instructed in geometry, know much in history, have followed the philosophers with attention, understand music, have some knowledge of medicine, know the opinions of the jurists, and be acquainted with astronomy and the theory of the heavens. So that's, of course, a little bit... Uh, old-fashioned but but I think it's to me it's, it's quite interesting to see that uh, in some sense the disciplines as we know them today were not it was not the case uh, earlier uh, in, in in human history uh, maybe we used to work much more uh, between the disciplines or, or, or we didn't really have those categories even um, and, and and from a, a philosophical point of view, you would you could argue that that actually, and that's of course the Western f philosophical tradition, uh, since uh, Democritus and Plato, um, you know, Western thinking have been dominated by a very uh, reductionist and a very dualist way to understand the world. Um, and maybe that's, uh, I mean, that has helped us a lot, of course, to, to you know, look at things individually and, uh, and analyze different elements individually. But now we've come to a point where we just realize it's, it's not enough. We need to, to think uh, between the, the, these categories that we have uh, until now been, have been separated. So we all, I think everybody mentioned complexity, right? And the increasing complex, the nature of complexity uh, of systems and uh, that control us or that we depend on. Uh, so given the fact that, you know, things are complex, I am assuming or I would presume that, you know, integration is also complex from multiple dis disciplines, right? Because you're dealing with a very complex integration of, in a complex system. So how, how do we do this as a practitioner or as a design practitioner? You know, I mean, what is our role? Uh, how would we bring about this uh, integration and amalgamation? I open this question to any of the panelists who can start with this. I'll give it a try. Um, uh, in Copenhagen, um, what we try to do is to to yeah think holistically about uh, the world and integrate uh, not just one discipline, but 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 actually try to synthesize the technological, the cultural, historic, and the uh, architectural aesthetic qualities into one, um, with careful consideration to uh, the that we live on a limited planet, uh, and 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 the, the planetary boundaries have now been uh, transgressed. Yeah, so so trying to 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 integrate both technological issues, which is uh, has to do with uh, quantitative uh, sciences, uh, basically that we should be able to measure things uh, from a life cycle uh, approach, uh, but we should also uh, integrate that with the cultural historic aspects uh, on that specific side, and of course uh, the architectural aesthetic. Uh, how do we how do we emotionally uh, relate to to the things we do? Um, and uh, and for me, that's that triangle between the three is uh, is an interesting way to try to 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 approach it. And and how, and then you may ask, how do you do that? And and that's of course a longer uh, uh, complex question. But but we try to combine both in the practical um working with the actual material with some more philosophical and historical aspects 
to, to speculate on that, right? I mean, this integration, uh, if it is possible at all, um, how do we do it? I mean, like, I'm just anticipating, I mean, I, I'm expanding on uh, a question that you yourself raised at the end. Uh, what are the nuts and bolts of integration? How, how do we as a practitioners with a certain skill set, how do we go about doing this integration? I, I would actually argue that um, integration happens when you've got a group of people working towards one purpose. Um, and that purpose, this is what the aim of transdisciplinary design is to me, is that you're working towards um, a certain purpose that is impactful, although this you, this word has been used a lot since COVID-19, but um, you're trying to create relevance and impact in a real life scenario. This is my personal opinion. I know that purpose can be ideological as well. It can be psychological. It can be um, it can be whatever the project is presenting itself, like the actual outcome would be decided by the project. But the project I usually work for are I have community outcome, real outcome with an impact. So the integration happens the first step that the entire group knows what they're working towards and they're in the integration occurs in terms of what skill set and what knowledge and what mindset do we need to carry through this project to achieve this outcome, um, this purpose. So in my humble opinion, I would say that transdisciplinary design without a clear purpose, without an impactful purpose, it doesn't, to me, it's not complete. <laughs> um, because it's transformative, transforming theory into action, transforming um, um, certain ideology into uh, to become a philosophy, a life philosophy, transforming people's lives, transforming the system, is transformative. So transformation without integration of skills, knowledge, uh, purposeful uh, scenarios uh, would make the purpose of transdisciplinary Incomplete. I think that's an interesting, um, an, an interesting opinion. And I, of course, I agree. Uh, but I think the, the actual act of doing this um, is uh, more difficult than you make it sound. Um, and at least that's that's my experience. And um, to me, there is a, a lot in. Of course, if you work all together to this to this single purpose. Um, excellent and and that's how it should be done um but within that it is um, of vital importance that you understand what it is that you as an individual or a group of people with a certain knowledge can contribute to the bigger whole and so the work that you do the outcomes of it should be usable for um in 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 the bigger picture and so um in this entire thing um I think understanding um, basically what, what uh, has been said before, the relation between a former silo, which maybe is an individual or is a single discipline, and uh, the system that links everything together, understanding that relation, I think, is also of vital importance. And within that, I think we're talking about transdisciplinary uh, approaches. Um, so the, the act of translation, of finding a common knowledge that we can all understand and contribute to, I think is uh, is one of the key points there. Mm. So speak, speaking about approach, uh, where does this design situate itself? I mean, are we leading the show here? Are we capable of leading? Are we prepared to lead? Absolutely. 100% you lead by design because without that mindset of innovation and design, you have no, no engine to drive. So the driver is the design innovation. And I'm talking from experience because I have led, <laughs> I know that it's more difficult than it seems, but I have um, led teams where we have every single time an outcome. And the key here is communication from the beginning to communicate what is the common purpose, how are we going to lead, with what methodology, and what skill sets. Once you have that, then you can have a final outcome. And I'm talking here, again, from experience leading successful projects, especially in the food design domain, which is a kind of an old new discipline. It's been around since the 1980s. But um, 
you always lead with innovation and design innovation. Why? Because we have this lateral thinking, this malleability and flexibility to actually break the silos. Um, to a scientist, for example, hypothesis is set right from the beginning. To a designer, the hypothesis is whatever we say it is. So we've got this flexibility to kind of work between between the gaps and work across the boundaries. We're not as rigid in our um, outcome and mindset as other disciplines are, and rightly they should be, because science has to be quite rigid in order for them to come up with um, certain um, you know, outcome. So we lead, I, in my opinion, again, and from my experience, we lead with design innovation. Um, that's the driver to me to trans to transformation. I would I would like to react to that also based on what uh, Nikolai said previously. Um, he was describing a triangle in his lines of work um, that uh, should should find a balance somehow. So also in uh, oddly enough in my line of work there is also an important triangle. So talking about mobility design, basically we're talking about people, about vehicles, and about an environment in which this is happening. And um, those are disciplines that have been existing before. For the environment, there is architecture, there is urban design. Uh, for the vehicles, of course, there is, there is vehicle design in all, uh, in all sorts and shapes. And then for uh, the people, of course, we have user experience design and service design. And so the interesting thing, talking about mobility design, um, and I think this connects very well to um, what just has been, been said, is that um, usually at the start of a project, it is not clear in which area of this triangle we are going to tackle the problem. We know what we want to do, but we have a lot of um, possibilities in hand, and uh, some of them are easier, some of them are more useful. Um, and so it is to be discovered in the process of the project, um, how we are going to tackle this. And so this is something that uh, we do on a daily basis uh, in, um, in the design practice in Grand Studio, but it's also something that is very fun to work on with the students um, that at the start of a project, we have no clue where it is leading. You know, We, we, we have this common goal. We have um, this uh, ideology working together to a purpose, but we do not yet know how we are going to exactly solve this. And this is, uh, this is quite exciting. So there, there is a bit of maybe suspension of disbelief even at the start that we can work with, um, that, uh, that we can aspire to. So are we, are we talking about a super discipline, a generalized design? Uh, I mean, design is a generalized discipline or are we uh, talking about, you know, the current disciplines that exist, uh, reinventing themselves into something uh, you know, different. I, I do think it's 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 both ways. It's like a, a reinforcing uh, circle, or um, I think the individual disciplines for sure benefit from the whole, but also the whole benefits from the individual disciplines. And so, uh, for for me at least, it's um, it's something that uh, that reinforces uh, both sides at the same time. Any other perspectives on this, uh, Professor Nikolai? Yeah, I would like to um, add add a perspective maybe uh, that I personally I'm, I'm, I'm I find I interesting at the moment um, or, or very important actually and that's of course the planetary boundaries that we are in fact part of a larger uh, ecosystem and and we're not we're not we're not alone and and when we design things and transform things it's actually it actually has an impact a larger impact it's not just a question of of transforming uh, the world so that we can live in it uh, we need to have that overall perspective that uh, there is a limit to what we can do and that's a, a new new perspective uh, in the sense it's it's actually not at all all new because the, the ecological economists have been talking about this for 50 years or more than 50 years but but in in design and in architecture i think that we have had the idea that we could just continue and do stuff and make things and mm. uh, but we cannot 
uh, six out of nine planetary boundaries have now been crossed, and 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 we are in deficit on the ecological balance uh, worldwide. Um, so that's for me, I think, a huge and very very important aspect that we need to consider. How can we how can we design things without just extracting uh, resources, without just making a lot of stuff that people buy and sell and and you know uh, is part of this uh, this uh, linear economy uh, a linear economy is not possible uh, so we need to kind of do what we do this synthesis that we've been talking about this integration of of multiple disciplines, but we need to do it with careful attention to the bigger picture that, that there is a limit to what we do. I, so we pro yeah, sure, please. Uh, don't, don't. Now I just wanted to say that this is spot on. This is exactly what transdisciplinary design is all about. Um, this is the impact that I was talking about. It's not just to produce more consumer society because this is what, what got us into trouble in the first place. Yeah. So transdisciplinary design is getting the best thinkers in their domain under one roof and just say, how can we fix this? How can we create something better than what we have? How can we identify gaps in this system to make it work better? Not for us, not for people, for beings. <laughs> beings meaning not just it's user experience that got us in the in this first in this mess in the first place again according to my opinion we need to look at the entire ecosystem of people insects plants microorganisms macroorganisms to see how can we uh, fix what we have ruined all these centuries and i just want to add that you're right about this not being a, a new kind of thinking i mean if you look at leonardo da vinci he was a transdisciplinary um, team in his own right. <laughs> you know, he blended those boundaries already. So we're not really introducing something new. We're just reinventing a um, old new methodology. So hundred percent. See, my own my own take uh, uh, as to why, as designers, you know, we can't play uh, let's say coordinating role if not a leading role, is the fact that you know we're great synthesizers, right? And uh, we can we can. Uh, bring, you know, information from a synthesized and very uh, accessible format. I would agree that that's one of our key uh, strengths that we bring to the table, that, you know, we are communicators, we, we play with information, we think visually, which is a big part of it. Uh, would you agree or would you have anything to add to that? Specifically or... Um... Uh, uh, what, what I... I um... I think I think there is two aspects to that, and maybe um, excuse me if I'm getting a little bit, uh, um, yeah, taking a detour here. But 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 um, I think maybe we should talk about this double uh, quality of 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 designing and 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 multidisciplinary design as both an aesthetic question. One that is, you know, we transform physical material and and we we do it uh, so that uh, people can can use it and benefit for people and planet and, and and what we've just been talking about. But but doing that, there's also some ethical uh, implications to that, or some ethical questions uh, that is about uh, for who. Uh, do we do it and and how can we share that in a more uh, um, responsible way um so so what I'm, I'm 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 at the moment i'm quite interested in a in a in a writer called joe joan tronto who talks about uh, uh, ethics of care and an ethics ethics of care that involves five different uh, qualities and the first one is attentiveness that we need, that is about caring about something or someone. Uh, the second one is responsibility, which is about caring for. And the third one is 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 competence, caregiving, how, how yeah, giving care to someone or someone. 
Uh, and then responsiveness is about receiving care. And then the, the fifth uh, element she's talking about is plurality, or, um, which is also sol solidarity, uh, being, uh, yeah, uh, uh, being aware that, that, that we are part of this larger uh, ecosystem. Uh, so for me, this, uh, this doubled um, quality of, yeah, that aesthetics is in fact an ethics question and vice versa. Um, I'm not sure I, I, I answered your question, uh, sort of like, but, the, uh, but, but I find this, this an, an important uh, uh, aspect. I get a sense that uh, I think uh, we, are, we are definitely still designing artifacts uh, or services. But we are also designing uh, in a dimension beyond. I think in more in a more critical way, uh, things to do with you know attitudes and ethical positions, and things like that. Like, um, are we? I mean, current this current pedagogical models today and in design schools specifically or architecture schools, uh, are we are we preparing our design student uh, with uh, you know <clears throat> strong positions of the sort? depends on the school i would say and it would depend on the university so um i can only talk about the schools and universities i have taught in and i'm teaching in at the moment if it does not have a real impact i do not teach it <laughs> that's my role <laughs> um and if it doesn't answer. have thank you <laughs> but it doesn't have if it doesn't have transdisciplinary design as well because i bring that dimension into the workshop already so yeah. students have to be from mixed design disciplines i i have not worked in silos for a long time and i don't it would be interesting to go back and work in silos again i think i have seen universities that are still working in silos and there's going to be a big industry gap for the students once they graduate because you know, corporate corporations at the moment and design practices are kind of working across disciplines and in transdisciplinary um, models. So it would, I don't think my mindset allows me to go back and work in silos. I would get bored from the first hour. That's my, it's me. So I don't know about uh, Nicola and Rousseau, what he what they think. I think um, <clears throat> what I came to understand working working with the students is that actually most of the time what we um, do or what what our teachers do with the students in class is uh, not specifically work um, to set up this methodology or to uh, design this specific thing, but um, the, the hardest part probably, and I think this very much uh, merges with um, um, the, the discussion of my two colleagues here, is um, trying to understand the question, trying to um, formulate um, a thing that uh, needs solving somehow. And um, this, of course, is... Um, is, a, is a holistic act. It's something that you cannot arrive to if you um, do not uh, understand uh, the, the systemic nature of things these days. But so, um, yeah, to, to me, part of the answer is um, in trying together to come up with um, an interesting question that you want to solve uh, and to, in that way, better society um, in there. So can I prevail upon each of you to uh, conclude with a foresight about, you know, how do we take it from here to tomorrow? I mean, how, how probably, you know, what, 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 what would it look like, you know, let's say any, a design practitioner or a practice uh, maybe in about uh, five, 10 years away? I could start with saying, um, like if I'm addressing students or even practitioners, I would start with saying, think about the pro your own profession in the big global context. Um, how relevant will this profession be and will it still exist in its current form? 
um, and and his current purpose. And if not, which closest profession will it merge into? Mr. Nikolai, a few words from you. On. Well, uh, what, what I think is important at the moment is uh, that we need to develop a better uh, in ourselves and our students uh, a better understanding of uh, that we are not separated from, but that we are actually part of a larger ecosystem and that that the things we do uh, that we use material resources and energy and 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 what we do has an impact on 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 yeah it's not just stuff that we make it's it's something that actually has an impact on a lot of things a lot of people's lives and and animals and and so on uh, ecosystems uh, so so and I, I don't have the answer to that how how can we get cl a closer understanding of that we should not just start from scratch every time that we design something but that we actually build upon knowledge and that uh, that we before we start uh, or, or more maybe more 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 Concrete. Uh, uh, before we start a project at the school uh, or uh, in our in my department, we always make a thorough analysis and valuation of what is already there as a starting point. Trying to understand what are the qualities that are there, how can we work with them, um, and then the most difficult thing is how can we do that so we, uh, yeah, make no harm. Professor Wouter. What does the transdisciplinary designer look like in 10 years? I mean, I'm just... Uh... Uh, yeah, I, I find this um, rather difficult to answer. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that, um, as I said before, to me, uh, transdisciplinary design is also um, forming new disciplines within design. And so that means that it's in constant evolution still. And... Um, we have been talking before about these vertical silos and this horizontal system uh, that is crossing it. And I came to understand that um, it will not be enough just to um, all become generalists and all work on this horizontal um, transdisciplinary connection between everything else. There still will be a need for specialists um, because it's impossible for one human being to be expert on every single aspect of um, a, uh, a transdisciplinary design approach or, or design in general, um, which would also mean that there would be no need for a transdisciplinary design approach, because if someone can cover it all, then what's the purpose of it? And so I came to understand that um, while... Um, trying to approach this more in a horizontal way, in a systemic way, um, it becomes apparent that um, there are still knowledge gaps. There are still, um, or maybe now they start to emerge uh, new ideas of new shapes of specialists as well. Um, so new disciplines that are not per se transdisciplinary, but are very specialized in something and can contribute um, to this uh, transdisciplinary uh, approach. And so that's also a bit what I was saying before, um, that the, the silos or the um, individual skills or the, the really deep knowledge experts of a certain discipline, um, they feed into this transdisciplinary, more general approach and vice versa. And I think um, this is a, a system that will remain relevant and will um, be of, um, of, of very high importance um, and remain important also in the future of uh, transdisciplinary uh, design studios. So I think we have, we have at this point a consensus on the need uh, for transdisciplinarity and an approach that uh, encompasses a much uh, larger area of disciplines. I, and I also get a sense uh, from all your, from the conversations that we've had so far uh, that uh, we are already in there. We are already trying things in this space and we are confident of the approach and we are confident of, uh, you know, design playing a role, a uh, critical role. I think that is already tried in some experiments and some 
the approach is already in play right here. And I think we're confident about that. And this has to be taken forward. I think that's definitely clear at the end of this conversation. And um, and I think that we are also concluding today, I think, with a very, very clear uh, understanding that uh, the design will need to aspire uh, to ask larger questions than what it asks today. Uh, and uh, our is beginning to ask today. Uh, and uh, that uh, that will become an inherent part of you know of the design approach, you know, to ask these larger questions. I think uh, I think this is essentially what I uh, can conclude uh, from a conversation. Very interesting perspectives from all of you. And uh, we have another fifteen minutes, and I thought I will use this uh, the time for uh, questions from the audience. We have quite yeah. a large audience today, uh, so I will. Uh, Store open for uh, questions. What about the idea of training and expertise in the field? How does transdisciplinary disciplinarity counter accusations of insufficient skills or competences? From uh, Professor Agnishika, uh, we have this question from Professor Agnishika. What about the idea of training and expertise in this field, in a field? How does transdisciplinarity counter accusations of insufficient skills or competencies? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, we're talking here master level, right? With transdisciplinary design, uh, this is where students start to um, work with other with other disciplines. Um, that platform of specified um, skills, definitely, they students need that. But at the master's level, when they come in, for example, um, again, from talking about uh, my experience, when they come into the master's level, we look at every single student, what is their superpower? What are they good at? <laughs> you know, for example, in architecture, they'd be good at, um, you know, the, the, the architectural skills that they, they acquire, which is drafting, which is, um, um, you know, uh, form, function. Um, Design, for example, industrial design is the same. Um, scientists is the same thing. So we ask every student to give us what skills are they good at. And when we're working on a project, each student um, will showcase their skills to work on this specific project. So um, we're not, they, if anything, the actual work with uh, with other teams enhances these skills because they'd be able to learn from each other. So if um, industrial designers draw in a certain way and architects draw in another way, there's a merger of skills here and there's a merger of, um, in, through interaction, you'll find that this enriches their individual skills. And um, if anything, it becomes more interesting. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say it's taking away from um, you know, from their expertise in that specific field, I would say it enriches their their skill by adding new knowledge and new set of skills to them. Any other perspectives? Uh, any, any other answers to this question? No, How I this... find this um, um, a very interesting, um, uh, a, a very interesting take on the question, and I I fully agree. I. I wondered for quite a bit of time whether you could um, teach a transdisciplinary design approach um, before a master level. Um, so I wonder, uh, and I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that at least you should master a certain discipline before you um, can enter in the mindset of a, a transdisciplinary design approach um, in mm -hmm. a schooling system. And so um, what we do, for example, at the European Design Institute with the students, um, we um, never um, went into the, the, the classic way of teaching um, the, the professor in front of the class and um, the students just reproducing uh, what, what has been uh, taught on the exam at the end of the year. So we consider ourselves truly a transdisciplinary team together with um, uh, the students and the teachers, um, we are this team that are um, tackling uh, the questions and trying to come up with uh, interesting solutions. And so this entire mindset, of course, um, means that um, 
who is part of this transdisciplinary team and what type of luggage or background he or she has um, plays a role in um, the outcome of the eventual solution or project. And so um, there are always two questions that I like to ask on the, um, on the little talks that I have with, uh, with the students before they enroll. Uh, the first is, um, what is your unique skill that you bring to something that you cannot bring? So someone else should bring it. And so based on these two questions, actually, um, it's rather interesting to um, compose the group of students and teachers to actually try to cover um, the, the skills that we think are necessary to, uh, to um, be covered in a, in a sufficient way as a team, so not anymore as an individual. I think we have a very interesting question here, which I want to sort of prioritize. Would we be looking at regular 95 jobs or step-by-step -step group project to solve these problems? Can I repeat it? Would we be looking at a regular 95 jobs or step-by-step -step group projects to solve these problems? How do we how do we really see this panning out from a prospect uh, from a practice perspective? Honestly, I think this goes also hand in hand with um, cultural um, approach to work ethics. Um, I, I've seen people working in many different ways across the world um, with a different type of relation uh, between private life and, uh, and professional life. Um, to me, those two approaches are not incompatible. Um, you can do uh, group projects and, and approaches in a nine to five way. Um, but I think the connotation of the, the person that asked the question of a nine to five is something that you do because you have to do and they're counting the hours and not the results, um, which, of course, if the interpretation is in that way, then I fully agree and we need to move to um, result based much more than uh, than hour based. Um, but I think that is that is just almost like a, an answer that is probably too general uh, because that's an evolution that uh, that anyway, um, at least for if you're not a a mechanic or um, or, or a manual uh, doing manual labor, then uh, I think this is uh, this is just a, a general evolution. So I would be very interesting to uh, interested to uh, hear the opinions from uh, uh, the other professors that have. Uh, or work in, in uh, different areas of the world? My take on this is um, a bit unconventional in terms of you know, university um, pedagogy. If our students at the end of the day are going to be working, most of them, nine to five in a transdisciplinary teams, why aren't we bringing this to the university teaching? You know, at the end of the day, our students are not going to be working in silos only with design, with industrial designers, with architects, with interior designers. They're going to be working with teams of builders, um, architects, um, design researchers, uh, graphic designers. Um, and, you know, they're going to be bringing different skill sets to the, to the, to the job. So if that's the case, um, I would believe that our design this uh, pedagogy of transdisciplinary is is mimicking <laughs> the uh, the industry and not the other way around. If that answers the question. Well, I have a I have a small anecdote maybe that that could maybe add to that question because uh, what are we really talking about when we talk about work? Is it the digital work in front of the computer? Or, or what is it? We we have a, a, an assignment at the Royal Academy where we built uh, stuff one to one, uh, small small buildings and uh, and interventions into existing structures, and that's a really really nice way to to work because yeah you you really get a feeling of the things. But an anecdote is that one of our students uh, last time we did it, she said. It was so interesting to suddenly, uh, you know, go home every day, be tired in the, in your whole body, and and have felt that, okay, materials are not just something that is abstract, but is something real that you that you actually move around and you need to coordinate with a lot of different people to to make it work. 
so that's uh, yeah maybe in in continuation what Dali said that 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 uh, this this small practice uh, like a like a yeah uh, an imitation of a real life uh, was was really really interesting uh, way to 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 teach uh, in my experience. What I love about this this discussion, Sudakar, is that you've got transdisciplinary design within transdisciplinary design um, education institutes. So you've got three different um, yeah. transdisciplinary design pedagogy, and I think a workshop is in order here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I agree. I agree. I think that's that's the very interesting perspective that we're getting here. That you know you have already embraced transdisciplinarity uh, in some sort, and then we talk about uh, transdisciplinary within that. Uh, so, but I have a number of questions which are asking this very pointed, uh, uh, all directed towards this very pointed uh, uh, question, in a sense. Um, are there skills that are very specific uh, to, you know, transdisciplinary design that, you know, we will have to acquire over and beyond uh, what today is considered the connection? I think I have a number of questions which are coming from different directions, but essentially asking the same thing. Is there some skill that, you know, which we think is different, unique, something that we have to add to our toolkit? I think that's a question that I think I have a number of questions. Um, Open-mindedness, just being open. Um, that, that I found, um, you know, extremely, important when it comes to transdisciplinary design because you are dealing with different disciplines you can't afford to judge that your discipline is the best um, so just being open to to other disciplines being open to your own innovation being open to you changing and transforming as you go into the project you are going to be transforming into um, you know because you're merging and you're melting into other disciplines you're going to be transforming yourself. So uh, this is what I usually tell the students, just be open, um, you know, and be open to your creativity. You're going to, there's going to be a moment where you're creating differently and you're going to get scared, but this is not me anymore. Um, so that would be my this one number one skill set that I ask my students to have before we start any project. And maybe I would add <clears throat> on top of that, um, oh, Along that uh, empathy, uh, which is uh, mm. the, the ability to to not just yeah to be open on one side, but also be able to to through that openness to to feel empathy towards uh, other people and and mm. and the situation you're working in. No, I I agree with both of you, but I think. Um... What I have seen also with the students is sometimes then it switches slightly too far um, and um, in, in the sense that uh, after a while, then there is one student that is trying to um, transform literally into uh, the skill set of a different student and then trying to tackle the problem from the other side, which is completely not his or her expertise, which of course is interesting to see, but sometimes uh, for the benefit of the project, is it, it is also important to not just completely forget your own uh, expertise and because that is your your strong point that is that is um, mm. your uh, the, the 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 big advantage that you have and you can push the project forwards uh, with with that knowledge and that skill set so uh, yes uh, absolutely be very open minded um, empathy is is absolutely important but also do not just throw overboard everything that you stand for and that you know yourself so. Mm. I have this, I think, I think a very, another very interesting question. Uh, who, who are our clients in transdisciplinary design? I mean, is it the government sector <laughs> or is it, it, or will it be a private organization as well? I think that's an interesting question. It's coming from the same, uh, I think, student, if I'm not mistaken, who asked the earlier question about work. The universe so, is your client. <laughs> Um, 
any 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 client. I mean, I run transdisciplinary um, workshops as a business apart from my academic job, right? And um, clients are institutes, corporations who are willing to change and do things differently with planetary outcome. Um, these are the clients. The clients are people who are looking at our world and thinking we need to transform it for the good, designed for good. Uh, we need to transform it for the better. We would like to change our way. We would like to change our strategies. So your client are the like-minded like people who are looking for impactful projects like you. Professor Wutter, in your case, where are your clients coming from since you're already practicing in this space? Um, uh -huh. it's, it's both government and, uh, and private sector. Um, and basically every uh, entity that deals with uh, complexity or um, maybe has reached um, within um, the own discipline, reached a stalemate or a status quo that uh, they would like to have challenged. And so um, truly that, that can be government as well as, uh, as a private sector. And that is, that is uh, our daily reality, yes. So I don't think there is a hard line. But I think in Denmark, I think uh, at least what I've heard uh, given numbers, I think government spend is uh, disproportionately high in the area of design. Uh, is government a big client of yours? Uh, or is, 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 does the government uh, give the impetus for most of what's changing? Um, in, in my opinion, um, usually not, oddly enough. Um, mm -hmm. So um, also even in the way how, for example, um, if you work for a government, um, often it is through public tenders and so on. And the way that the evaluation of the tenders is made is not transdisciplinary, is uh, mm. usually still very much uh, in the silos, in the traditional disciplines. And so if you do not follow um, that, um, that uh, reasoning, then it becomes very hard to win the tender uh, at the start. So you need to sometimes be a bit creative to, um, to get on board and to be able to actually do what you want to do because you believe that that is the right thing to do. And so um, governmental systems um, in, in, in that way um, sometimes are um, yeah rather difficult to um, uh, to to go to, to get on board with. Um, while talking about the private sector, um, private sector much more than government um, talks about uh, or, or is interested in uh, in uh, innovation um, and usually also has um, a bit more budget uh, to dedicate. Uh, to, uh, to to yeah, try to be better than the competition. Um, and so um, from my experience, at least in my line of work, uh, usually um, true advancements um, are more pushed by uh, private sector than by governments, not exclusively, but more. And we also have another third entity, right? the non-government, uh, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations. I think they're very well funded and they are also willing to take radical steps. Yes, exactly. And so those are those are in fact are are interesting and might even be a, a, yeah a, a vibrant mix of uh, of all that I said before. Yes, absolutely right. And okay, we'll uh, go to our last question before we. I think we will be extending our time. Just the one last question. Uh, I think we have here. Um, how do we convince stakeholders of the importance and impact of uh, transdisciplinary design during its infancy in the world. We have this question from a student of mine, an ex-student of mine. To me, um, it has to do with um, case examples. And so, yes, I agree that we're still um, at the, the very start of um, what uh, transdisciplinary design could uh, eventually uh, mean for the world. So that means that um, the portfolio of uh, realized projects um, is still rather small. Um, and I, honestly, the, how to convince stakeholders, I think, um, is based on results, is based on um, the, the benefits, uh, is, based on, uh, is based on examples. And 
my experience at least is that usually for a transdisciplinary approach um, you do not really have to convince the stakeholders unless as what i said before is like the government with these very rigid uh, systems but um, usually especially for uh, in, in the private sector um, they are all ears because they already recognize um, the potential benefit of um, what it is that you try to uh, propose or, or are yeah. proposing. So for me, at least in my experience, um, that's not really a big hurdle uh, to, um, to be taken. Same. I 100% I agree. I never try to convince stakeholders with words um, because there's no no point you demonstrate through action and through the work the portfolio of your students i mean in the food design i've got enough portfolio that um, people can see what the results are and what we stand for and like i said like-minded people are going to be attracted to that um, action-based um, portfolio that you're you're showing uh, you don't want to convince because if you convince someone, they're going to change their mind later on and they would have expectations that you can't attain. So it's better not to convince and just to attract. Yeah, I don't know if I can add uh, something at all to this, except uh, to, to, to point out that the art-based methods and the quality of the results, of course, has a very strong potential to, to inspire and evoke uh, mm. people that uh, are going to use it. I think uh, we have we exceeded our time by a little. And uh, with this, we'll conclude this, uh, I think, superbly interesting, I think, uh, uh, conversation. I think we will make a transcript of it and, you know, which will provide us uh, with uh, further grounds for analysis, reading, speculation, reflection. Uh, I, I really want to thank uh, all of you uh, uh, Dr. Dondi, uh, Professor Gupta, uh, and uh, Professor Nikolai, and thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be part of this. Uh, I mean, I can't thank you in the uh, The fact that you all agreed at the first go, and you know, and I think it's, it's just wonderful that you're here. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much again.